everybody, welcome back to Final Resonance TV and episode number 37 of Van Halen Stories. Today, I'm all the way in Pasadena, California with our awesome guest. This is Tom Broderick. Some of you may remember Tom in the uh, early DVD from uh, DVD about Van Halen back about 10 or 15 years ago. You had some guest oh, spots yeah, yeah. in there, right? Right. Like and, 15 years ago. Right. right. Been a while. So the JJ Jackson one or whatever. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right from MTV. That's right. So he was in that documentary, and uh, I'm glad to have you because you go way, way back with the Van Halens back to when they were teenagers, right? That's pretty much how it started. Mm -hmm. You know, you and your brother, your two brothers, all well, two of them played. You played, and your, one other Rob played. My brother Rick actually plays sax. Did he? Okay. Yeah. So we all play something. Okay. Yeah. So what was your musical background influence? What got you into music? Uh, well, everybody my age is going to say the same thing, the Beatles. Right, <laughs> you know? right. February 9, 64, Ed Sullivan show. It was an earthquake if you're in my generation, you know. Right, right. I remember I had a paper plate. I'd color them yellow for cymbals, pencils. I had a little Quaker Oats for drums. You know, that was it. <laughs> How old were you then? Oh, gosh, I don't know. Uh, 64, I was probably six, seven, okay. you know, right around there. Yeah, because when I, you know, we start to go to the Van Halens, when do you meet them? What year was that? Um, well, I guess when they moved over to that Las Lunas house, uh -huh. and we had moved from Allen, I mean, from Hill to Allen, so we were now close by. I think uh, my brothers maybe met them doing paper routes. I don't think they went to the same. I think they went to Longfellow, and we went to Jefferson, different elementary schools and stuff. Right, right. Um, it's funny, when we got back together a couple of years ago, the first thing they started talking about was their paper routes. and. How that guy would never pay him and who was cheating on all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But, uh, yeah, so I think Ed, Ed, Rick, you know, Rick's the same age as Ed and Rob's the same age as Alex. Right, right. Um, so they met him, I think, I think that's when they met him, so anyway, doing paper routes and stuff. How much older are your brothers than you? Uh, Rick's two years older and Rob's three years older. Okay. So and you, then the Emersons are the same age as right, us. Right, with you know, Greg. As, yeah. as the Brodericks. You know, I'm the same age as Alan. Greg's the same as Al. And... Dave's the same as Ed. You all came up with, with Greg as well. Yeah, they were right up the street. Right. And I should show you where that is. You missed that on your little tour. I, yeah, I know right. when you were driving around, you missed my house. You drove right by it in your video. But I did? Yeah, yeah. That's where <laughs> that picture of Ed playing the guitar, you could have just said, hey, right over there. Because then you turn left and you're at going on Lost Lunas there. All right, wait a minute. You said Ed playing the guitar. Which is that the one where you it's... You know, that famous shot of him when he's 14 or whatever with the fake 335. Okay, With yeah, my yeah, brother yeah, on yeah, drums. Yeah, 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 that's that Allen. That's on Allen. Okay, okay. Yeah, so the, the other day we were having a discussion about this photo that, that I, I found of uh, Ed at your brother's birthday party in 68. Yeah, that's it. That's in it. June of 68, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we were talking about. Ed had that, that hollow body and he had the little cap on. He's like mm -hmm. 13 years old at this point. Yeah. And that's the... What the, I guess what they call the Trojan Rubber Company? I don't know. They were just jamming, you know. Because <laughs> you see those pictures and people will put, you know, that. And Ed talked about that band a little bit. <laughs> yeah, he mentioned things as he, as he got through that. But, yeah, that, that was the, the, the late 60s. So what were you guys listening to? It was all Beatles or, like he said, Dave Clark Five was big for him. Yeah, Dave Clark Five and the Kinks, you know. I mean, the louder it got, the more we liked it, you know. As soon as something like when Cream was a big, big deal, that was a big change too. Cream and Hendrix. Right, right. Now you got Marshalls and, you know, I guess it was when Clapton, Blues Breakers probably the first time you got a Marshall cranked up and stuff, you know. So these guys start, um, you know, you, you, you're you intimate with the uh, Red Ball Jet and Mammoth, right? You were around for all that. I only saw Red Ball Jet once, and that was at the Civic with Van Halen when they didn't have Dave. Okay. Know? So I never really saw them. Uh, I wasn't familiar with them at all, really. Okay. Um, when Dave was in the band. Yeah. Never saw them, like, at a party or anything, really. So you just saw Dave for the first Would've time. Would have been cool. I, I never saw Snake without... Uh, Except with Van Halen, opening for Van Halen. But my friend Dana, he did see Snake somewhere else, like at a party with Mike. So we got to see Mike sing all night long. I got to see that set, too. Did you see Snake with him at the Pasadena High School? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's the one where I've seen the flyer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where they played with, with Mike there. So I guess that was, I guess, Mike and them just crossed past you that, from what I remember in the history of it. But Yeah, that was the gig where they... You know, is it was where they met? Where they got a real good look at Mike, yeah. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. So... Van Halen is is a mammoth for a while. Um, how much exposure did you have mammoth? Well, as soon as they started playing, I started going to see him. So yeah. was Ed singing? Yep. 
and mm -hmm. uh, and it was the th three piece. Yep, Ed Al and the Mark Stone. Right, right, Mark Stone. And Mark Stone sang a little bit too, actually. What can you tell about Mark Stone? Because that's something when nobody ever talks about. So uh, I don't know too much about Mark Stone other than just seeing him with those guys. You right, know? right. Um, like I'm, I was a young, I was a younger brother, you know, just right, right, poking around, you know, <laughs> right, for, for quite a while there. This is the early '70s, probably, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So what were the, just, we got a tape of them. You know, my brother recorded it at the Gas Company, which is a little club off across from PCC, it was right. upstairs, with it with Mammoth, you know. Uh, Nobody was there, <laughs> so we got a pretty good. I think I've heard some of those. Maybe yeah. there might so be. They're singing. They're doing Sabbath and. Yeah, that's what I've heard. One where, yeah. where they're doing uh, doing Sabbath and 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 there's one that's, it's probably we 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 were talking about the amp that's you hear in that. We think it's the the white bandmaster or, yeah, bandmaster right or, he had that uh, or blonde bandmaster. I forgot what it was. Well, he had a basement, I know. Yeah, um, but it didn't sound like a Marshall. It sounded a little cleaner. I don't remember what he was playing. Yeah. I knew you were going to ask me a lot of that's gear right. questions. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> you no. guitar nerds are going to be real disappointed. <laughs> <we're>, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, so that, yeah, so Mammoth is playing these gigs, and then and then Dave comes in, and, of course, they changed the name to Van Halen, and, and one of my other guests happened to be in the earshot of Dave when they were kicking this around. Oh. Do you remember that transition with when Dave came in and Mammoth? Yeah. What, what do you remember about it? Well, the, the, you know, the fact that it was like a, a lot of people didn't know Dave, you know. Right. So they weren't sure about this guy. You know, he seems over the top, you know, but uh, I thought he was great myself. I thought that's just what they needed. It was a singer, you know. Right, right. And I mean, you can't be afraid to be a, this, you know, he's, he's a, he got the right ego to do it, you know. Right, right. Well, you know, it worked out, right? yeah. yeah. <laughs> So you guys get he gets into the they start doing the club scene. When do you get involved with them, at, at working with them? Uh, that was after a while. I, I, I was seeing them a lot, you know. Before that, I would see them at the Civic and at parties, and I'd go to Gazaris and see them. I saw them at the Golden West and uh, everywhere I could. You Did know? you see them with UFO at Go Golden West? I, I didn't see that gig actually. Okay. I think so. And I actually worked a gig at that place afterwards right. too. Okay. At the Golden, so they did play. They played there several times actually. Right, um, so it was great to see him at Gazzari's, really, because a uh, small place, you know, and they're playing all night. And so, describe them at Gazzari's. Well, have you heard the dance contest tape? Yeah, yeah. I've heard some of that. Stuff. Yeah, well, there, that's that's good. It's yeah, <laughs> a good example, I would think. You know, right, right, right. Well, they were just rocking, and everything sounded like Van Halen. It was back in those days; they had a lot of covers that we didn't know were covers because you know? <laughs> we thought they were all originals. Because they were so obscure, you know, Spooky Tooth and Budgie, and you know, all these bands that we never even heard of, Captain Beyond, and they were doing. Yeah, I was telling you earlier about uh, the when they played over on the uh, City Hall steps. That my previous guest uh, Harold said they that he heard it from afar, and it was Captain Beyond. They were playing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, isn't that the one that's Captain? Yeah. It's a real odd time, you know, off time and stuff. Right, right. So you start, you watch them, you, you're at Gazar, you see all this great stuff going on. And like you said, their, their covers, Ed used to say I could never cover everything, anything very, you know, accurately. So it sounded like us no matter what, and that carries on to you really got me and things later. Oh, yeah, right. But, but, so when do you, when do you get involved in their, you know, working with them as a sound tech or, or uh, whatever. I'd say that was kind of later. Um, I think the main catalyst for that really was there's a tape from a PCC gig, and I remember listening to it with Ed in his van there, and the guitar would come, and then it would disappear, yeah. and then the guitar would come back up. All, all night long, I was doing that, and Ed's going, "What the hell is he doing? What's going on?" You know. And, uh, so then the next gig. He, he said, "You go to the, make sure my guitar is, you know." So I, I was just in g control of the guitar fader <laughs> at the, the first show, you know, right? Just to make sure that didn't happen anymore. And then my brother helped. He got a four track, which was a brand new thing, the TAC thirty three forty, you know, real to real four track. So we thought, "Oh, wow, this is great. Let's do a demo." So they recorded the basics at Dave's basement, and then they did the vocals at my house, and. Uh, and I think I did a little mix of that that they liked or something. I don't know. Maybe you have to ask Alex, you know. But anyway, they needed some help. Mainly we were roadies, you know. We were lugging stuff. But uh, but I went from the one fader to the board. I mean, what are you going to... That's stupid to stand there and, you know. <laughs> right, right, right. So just mix the show. It's, you know. Yeah, so, yeah, so you started mixing 
Uh, how many, I mean, like all the local clubs, all the Gazarias, whiskey? No, only when they had a big PA, you know. Okay. So only when everything was mic'd. You know, a lot of times, they would, if there was a small place, Dave would bring his PA and they would do it themselves like the Gazarias. That was all Dave's little outtakes that, oh, so they that sounded like this all the time, you know. <laughs> they did that at Gazarias, I didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because mm-hmm. today, you know, house PAs, it's kind of oh, yeah, There, was, kinda no, the there was no house PA at Gazarias. Right, right. We, yeah. uh. We know the story about Dave's PA and how he would bring that PA. It was like a tower PA or something, wasn't it? No, it was the square Altex with the horns. Oh, okay. Call. Yeah. Okay, so mm-hmm. it was bigger stuff. Maybe he had some columns too or something. I don't remember that, but yeah, had for a long time. That thing was pretty bulletproof. I mean, they beat the heck out of it. It kept working. So the uh, when you said, I guess we used it to record. We must have went through that to go because we only had four tracks. Right. Right. And we did the vocals and we did the little sound effects for Ice Cream Man and stuff. You know. Yeah, so when you, you recorded, this is one of the things about the shows that you, you, you ran sound at that I don't know if we, I don't even know if I know for sure, but is that where the recordings of their like Civic show came from? It didn't come from me, actually. Okay. It came from the whoever else was running the, in charge of the PA. Okay. I was just in charge of the mix, kind of, you know. Okay, so if somebody... I mean, it had... tape, so I, I don't think I even knew it, really, that they were recording. Okay. It was kind of a... I, you know, that's, a that's one thing I really regret, is not recording them more, but it was kind of looked down on like you were stealing from the band or something here. Right, right, right. You know? Right. So I didn't record gigs. I didn't take a lot of pictures of them or get autographs or anything that would have you know, been like the old man in the hard day's night, you know, selling eight by tens under Paul. Right, 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 <laughs> right. right. Because I always wondered, where, where, you know, where those tapes came from. So there was a PA that was provided. You, I think you told me this before in a conversation we had, that they, they would actually, there was a company that provided certain PAs. Is that right? Well, they would hire them, you know. Okay. The promoters would hire them. And they hired Tycho Bray for the last Civic gig, which is a real reputable company. Right. Big, huge, powerful PA. And in fact, they would bring PA in the later days to supplement the whiskey PA. Okay. To, to make it even louder. Right, right. They were loud as hell at the whiskey. I go to the whiskey now and see bands, I can't even believe the polite volume that they play at. <laughs> and I'm thinking, that's not rock and roll there, man. Last night I was there, it was, a, it was a, the peak with my watch. was like, hey, it's loud. It was like, it's 100 and, I think, four peak or whatever it was. You know, it wasn't really uncomfortable at all. But, but back then, you know, you, he was blowing all that stuff off the stage. Now, this is like the gear where everybody's, where Ed's borrowing stuff from everybody. That was purely just to look cool, right? Back in the for day. For Civic, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or for little, backups or whatever, in case he blew up something, you know. He had a bunch of, like, music man heads and stuff that, that are always kind of sitting off to the side during that first tour. You ever, you know anything about those? No. They're like backups or whatever. Probably just backups. Yeah, somebody probably said, here, you can have these. Yeah. Yeah, a lot you know, of people. My, uh, my brother Rob, yeah. he's, he has a, a role in a, like you see that picture of them playing at La Cañada High School, you know, those big PA? Yeah, yeah. That's my brother's. Okay. So he made the flash pots, my brother made those, you know. Uh, right. In fact, at the Civic picture where Ed's wearing the white pants backstage, if you look in the background to the left, I just noticed this the other day, Rob's in that picture, he's sitting against the wall back there. Wow. It's kind of hard to see him, but he is in that shot there. So what was Rob's role with? with and that also, the main thing I was getting at was the, yeah. the deluxe reverb. Yeah, you, know, you see in all the backstage pictures of him, of Ed, that's yeah. Rob's. You know? Okay. And I thought, you know, I thought Rob was going to ask him when we saw him a couple years ago, give me that amp back, you know. <laughs> but then I realized when I got some of his stuff, there's a check from Ed for 100 bucks. So he must have gave Rob 100 bucks for it at some point. Oh, okay. <laughs> So he didn't steal it after all, you know. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's wild. That's crazy. So that's what, a great little amp, man. Were the guys, uh, like, well, you went to Los Lones to house a lot? Did you go there a lot? Not a lot, no. Okay. Did you go inside ever? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and the one time I remember vividly, was it was memorable because he was at the stove. He was melting wax to dip the humbucker in, and he was also boiling strings on another burner. <laughs> and his mom was, you know. Over there, like she wanted her stove back. Like, what are you doing? You know. <laughs> wow, wow. I, I so those it. stories are true. He did boil the strings, just trying to do everything he could, you know, to get to well, pre-stretch that, them so they won't go out of tune and stuff. Well, that's you know, we're just talking about the new uh, new guitar, the Frankenstein, the original white and black one, and how 
he would maneuver that thing to keep it I in tune. I guess you got to do the same routine to keep that in tune. Right. That is a brass nut too, right? Yeah. 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 So yeah, they even have a video on how to do it. <laughs> I've like, seen that. Like, Crazy. <laughs> right. No one's doing that. <laughs> I know. But, but for him, it was such a it was a needed thing at the time. And like you said, he was boiling the strings. Well, look at how he was playing. He was keeping that thing in tune somehow. It was kind of magic, <laughs> really. Right. Then. Right. It was amazing what he did. Actually, we're close to Los Lunas within uh, within a stone's throw, but like a few blocks. Was this neighborhood always kind of middle class? or? Yeah, yeah, it hasn't changed much at all, really. It's really? nice and quiet. So. Yeah, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's always been beautiful. Yeah. But he didn't seem to have an attachment to Los Lunas very much. Like that. He never really talked in a positive light about Los Lunas. I don't know. I mean, when I saw him the last time, he had a picture of him recently taken in front of Los Lunas. Really? Yeah. Really? Wow. And yeah. in front of Marshall. Also. Uh, oh, yeah. So he kind of made the tour, you know. And, and, Did he? Yeah, yeah. So I wonder. He was even living there when they were gold albums. I know, walls, I you know. know. And I wonder, I wondered if he ever, you know, was like that about his home. Because you never hear that. But I just did. So yeah, that's, yeah. That's, no, that's, he does have memories for sure. You know, that's cool. Well, you know, there's a, there is the the incident with his father, where his father got his finger cut off in the mm -hmm. back, out back, on it by a trailer, I think it was, when he was moving it. But and then the garage out back, everybody talks about whether he actually painted anything in there, or did he like, did they ever practice in there? Most people say no. I don't think they ever practiced in there. No, it was real small. It was full of junk, and uh, right. there, I don't even know if there was power to it or whatever. Yeah. The only other time, I remember in the alley, I would go down the alley on my bike all the time. I had a friend down the street, yeah. and I'd cruise by and see what they were do, up to. And they were like painting the big Van Halen banner one day, you know. They wanted a bigger one for the Civic or whatever with the old, old school logo. logo. Right, yeah. right, 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 right. Yeah, they cool. were getting that together. Alex was working on that, I remember. They, uh, <laughs> there, there's stories about people, uh, other people in this area seeing him put a guitar body on a clothesline back there while mom was clothes, let her clothes up and he would that paint. makes more sense he would, doing it outside yeah, he would paint, paint, the guitar it, outside. paint them outside yeah he didn't have much room to do anything over there really right i was going to ask you there's this <laughs> one photo and I, I may have sent it to you but ed's sitting on a it looks like a couch with a window behind him there's that screened in sun porch that they say he he actually had room in at one point i think mm. kind of on the if you're looking at the house from the front it's on the right side but it's kind of hidden do you ever remember anything about that room or no. that picture? That picture has him with the white and black. Hmm. And it's a really, I'll send it to you. It's pretty wild. Is that like a dark wall and you see the sun in the back? That's not even that house, I don't think. Okay. Yeah, I've seen that picture and the yard's too big. I don't know where he's sitting there, but it's, okay. it's not Lost Lunas. Yeah, it looks like he's sitting on the couch and somebody's yeah, yeah. little. I think I know the picture you're talking about. Yeah, it's, if it's, it's that same one. It's one of the rare, one of the rare ones. I never ones. went into the bedrooms or anything over at Lost Lunas myself, really. Yeah. So PCC. Um, they, I guess they played over there or something? At oh, the, yeah. At the, they no, played in the auditorium. Okay. Yeah. Were those like organized events that they... Well, they were cool. They were like concerts, you know, because of the seating and everything. Yeah. Um, just like when they played the PHS auditorium. And they played the gym for a dance, too. They I never did. played in the quad for some reason. You did have bands in the quad. Really? Okay. But I don't think they ever did that at PHS. I talked to, I actually met Dr. Fisher's daughter at the NAMM show. Their music teacher who said, if it sounds good, it is. That was his phrase. That, oh, yeah? yeah? Yeah, that was his phrase. Oh, Ed stole that? And he did, yeah, and he would say that, right? And that was what Dr. Fisher had said to, to him, but he would spend time with the family. And so there was some pretty interesting stuff that I found out this weekend about the, the Civic itself. It sounded like crap, I hear. <laughs> yeah, it was a big barn, you know. The right. smaller room sounded a little better, but... Right. But when you got a lot of people in there, it wasn't that bad, you know? Yeah, and you and like you said, they moved around rooms. They didn't just play, yeah. play mm -hmm. the one, that the pit, they call it. By the time they got to the big room, they are filling it up, you know? Right. I don't how, know if they were selling it out, but... Uh, how many bands on something like that last Usually week? three. You've seen the flyers, like Mac Pinch and, you know... Yeah. Smokehouse and the, all those bands. Yeah, I, I met um, Carl, Carl Sandoval uh, this weekend as well, and Carl was in Smokehouse. And, uh, did you ever like the sound chamber itself? Though this is you sent me that picture yesterday. Right? I figured you would appreciate that. <laughs> well, it's a real sticker from the yeah. sound chamber. That's pretty. That's cool. like Strat I got from my brother who bought it there around the same time Ed got his destroyer. He bought that Strat, and it sounds better than a Fender. It's really nice. It's got a brass nut also. It's got the alembic uh, straddle blaster switch, like a boost. You know. Yeah, you know there was this thing that uh, somebody said about the alembic, these these pickup boosters that, yeah, that you yeah. could but you could install yeah, there's a little switch with a battery and you just it's it gives just basically more volume i thought it would like 
you know, get, turn it into a humbucker or something, but it's not that way at all. Right, right. But it's still pretty cool. The marshal that he had, the, the grail marshal, we all call it, um, he said it came into burying grass muke. Yes, and he, he, that's when he was doing paper routes or whatever, getting working up the money to buy that thing. He saw it in there. Right. And so I think, you know, the story about this being the Rose Palace amp. house amp, I don't know, maybe the guys who sold it to Barry Grasmick told him that. That sounds like I say fishy to me, you know, like, right, he's right. got a house marshal. I never heard of that in my life. Right. You know? Right. That's an interesting story. Yeah, the... the and the story of the Rose Palace is an interesting story, how it became a rock venue, because I went by there when I was home. That's uh, a barn, too. I'm sure it sounded like crap in there. <laughs> right, for sure. It's like an airplane hangar or something. <laughs> so the, the strip marshals, I mean, you know, we've talked about this a little bit, but Holmes would bring these things. About, about when did this happen? 75, maybe? They started bringing the strip marshal cab in 75? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, the 75 and 76 kind of blur together. I'm not sure... Uh, a lot of shit happened then. <laughs> right, right. But, uh, yeah, something like that. So they started yeah. coming and then eventually ended up on that tour, on the 78 tour. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a whole, like, there must have been 12 cabins or something. Well, it maybe stripped his own, too, and got some more. Or right, which is what Rudy said. He had actually stripped some himself. Yeah, 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 to add more to the, to the wall there. To the wall, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we've heard the story that they might be they might have been hot. <laughs> So, could be, could be, right? Have to talk to Chris about that. <laughs> well, I'm sure he'd come clean by now. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't tried to talk to him about it. <laughs> I told you he had a 200 watt Marshall, right, Chris Holmes? No, I didn't know that. I didn't even know they made one, you know. Wow. And he's so funny. He called me on the phone. Tom, I got a 200 watt Marshall. Check it out. And he puts the phone down and starts playing through it. Wow. And the phone is just, you know, like, right, <laughs> crushed. So there's a story about your dad that you tell your dad that they're going to be famous, and your dad's like, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell that story. Well, uh, you know, I mean, he just thought I was some kid who was enamored with a next-door neighbor guitar player, and I, I'm trying to explain to him, like, no, he's, he's good. He's, you know, everybody I've seen at the forum, he's better than. He's top-flight, you know, guitar player. And, right. Oh, you know, like... So anyway, when that first magazine came out, he had, you know, Guitarist of the Year or whatever. <laughs> I couldn't. I had to throw it in my dad's face. What do you think of that? You were probably how old? Then? Well, that's after the tour. You know, that's so, 1980 yeah. or whatever. So Whenever he won that award, so you were about 20. 21, yeah, maybe yeah. 20, 21. Wow, you're 21 talking to your dad. That's pretty funny. <laughs> well, there what, it did, is. what did he say? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> right on. <laughs> so in the set, late 70s at Gazaris and and uh, the whiskey. Ed starts tapping. Do you remember this happening? That happened pretty late, you know? Yeah. And I don't remember. It's funny. I don't remember the first time I saw him do that. Um, do you remember where maybe you no. saw him play? Do you ever do that? Hmm? When's the, like, if you think back when you well, saw him. Well, he did it at the Civic. He did it at, um, I don't know if he did it at Magic Mountain even, did he? Seems like I saw him do it for quite a bit before the Civic. So maybe he was throwing it in and out of, of solos or something. Because there were solos when I listened back to the bootlegs where he's, ne he's never doing this until, I want to say, mid-77. A lot of people say June or something like that. But then there's things after that where you don't hear it. I know. I know. It's, and it's hard to pin down when he started first doing it. I thought it was inspired by... Uh, it's late by Queen, but then I looked that up and nope, that that came out too late. He was already tapping by then, you know. Right, right. So the uh, Kilgore story about Harvey Mandel what, that could very well be. Yeah, I didn't I didn't know anything about that at the time. Harvey Mandel or tapping. So I always thought it was like you know the ZZ Top thing. Right, right. They, that album was huge. That you know there were certain albums that were really big, and at least in our neighborhood, I don't know about the rest of the world, but you know that right. ZZ Top, the Trace Ombre's album. Was a big deal, right? He got beer drinkers. And he did a little tapping on beer drinkers, and uh, right. Where, where else do you hear? It? There's a couple other places. Yeah, yeah. People were doing one or two taps. So who knows? But he says he got it from Jimmy Page, you know, doing the heartbreaker thing with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's, Maybe he did. Yeah. Yeah, he might have. I, I kind of thought he might have gotten it from a couple places. You know, George Lynch was on, and he told me that he uh, saw. Harvey with Eddie. They were in the room together watching Harvey Mandel and he's tapping in front of him. Well, I don't know about that. Yeah. 
I don't know. Yeah. Can't uh, verify that. Right. But it is. I'm pretty sure Ed just sat down and started playing with it and it just went. <laughs> right, right. Which know. is what, what's really interesting about 77 is how, you know, it just all of a sudden he explodes into all of all the things that he'd been working on kind of like culminated right when they went to record that first album. Because you listen to those a year earlier and it, it's not quite there with yeah, what you yeah. hear, right? Just, yeah. That's what was great about the whiskey, you know, they were getting there, getting there, getting there, then they had, then they were a well-oiled machine when they hit the whiskey. Right, because they had to switch, they went from Gazzari as, mm -hmm. as a cover band to mm -hmm. full original. Starwood, too. Starwood, right. And that's why those tapes, I mean, it was just all stage volume, so you're going to get drums and vocals if you do a board tape, you know. Right, right, right. Yeah, there's some pretty amazing audio, though. And that one that I think of, that I got, I don't know how I got, I mean, this is 90... One that I get the Civic tape from October of '77. That's just oh, it's the one where Ted Templeman was there. Yeah, it's their final Civic show. Yeah, right? and it's and the audio is insanely good. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and it's it's the first record. I mean, pretty you know, much, pretty, pretty much, right? Amazing. And that's the one with the flash pots. Uh, yeah, yeah. See, my brother had a really cool system. He had a bunch of foot switches, and each switch would control a uh, a box with four plugs in it. So you can plug one flash pot there, or you can plug four. So when you hit this switch. You know, you can have two go off, and then this switch, one, you know. And we had it all rigged at the end of the show. They were going to go, but no, Rudy just got a two-by-four and put it over the switches. I just went, boom. <laughs> all of them at once, you know. And wow. The fire truck showed up outside and shit. <laughs> so the, the horns that they had at the shows, that the car horns, mm -hmm. where, where did that idea come from? What happened with that? How'd that work? I don't know where they came up with that stuff. Really? They were just always tinkering, you know. But, yeah, because back then it was, you know, when we think of the first album, we think of it, you know, the speed being slowed down and all that. But when during the shows, it was just like literally like a oh, car. Just, bang, bang, bang. Yeah, yeah, Mike would do it whenever, you know. That was Mike's job. Mike was doing those. Mainly on House of Pain, he would do it. But other tunes, he would do it. In between songs, he would hit them, you know. Right. Mike was also the guy in charge of their cheap light show, you know. They had the little floodlights, green, red, and blue. Mm -hmm. Mike still, you can talk to Mike, and he'll say, Okay, this song went blue. <laughs> he still remembers all his cues. You know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's wild. Yeah, I remember seeing pictures of that. that pictures, those pictures from uh, Tahitian Gardens, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see that yeah. cheesy, it's just like half inch, you know, pipe. <laughs> right, right. With a couple it, of floodlights on it. And you see the destroyer from the sound chamber, which yeah. we were, we were mm -hmm. talking about. And its original finish there. And its original finish, which everybody thought was an edge. Pete Thorne has one of those. That right, right, he does. Where'd he you get that, man? I don't want one of those. He got one from a local guy, and he got, he got a decent deal on it. But, wow. but you know, now they're crazy. But, there, you know, that was said by Ed that it was that Chris and his were, were Carino or Limba. And almost everybody says it's it's Sin Ash now. Even I think even the Van Halen camp kind of came to that. I thought they were Carino Wood or whatever. I remember that being on the tag, I think. Uh, really? Yeah. yeah. Unless that was just the name of the finish. Or something. Right, right. Because it was an emulation of the finish from, could the, be. from could the 50s be. Gibsons. Yeah. yeah, could be. Yeah, it had that color and then everything. Because Limba's like the you know actual name of the wood, but the trade name. Sun Chamber was a funny place. It was yeah. kind of empty in there. and It just seemed like a real startup. You know, it didn't have a lot of stuff in there. Although they would rent PAs for bands, which was cool. They had like these... Uh, horrible was a music man or what trainer or something just you know mm -hmm. yeah something like that right so we'd go there for those once in a while and write a pa for a gig so that was over there by the playhouse yep and uh those two spaces that are just right next to the playhouse is that right yeah yeah i think you narrowed it down pretty good there did i get it mm -hmm. oh, okay i was gonna check because you know i always like to go back and make sure that i <laughs> that i nailed these parts well, the address is on the card there. well that helps, <laughs> that helps yeah 37 south or yeah whatever. but i didn't know that and then mm -hmm. i got and then uh kurt james and a few other people clued me into where it was so i was able to find that and Ball records where the original location was yesterday oh, fair oaks yeah. yeah 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 i was on at that yeah. at that spot yesterday and then i moved to wilson there that was a real cool spot both of those were cool that's where i first got into bootlegs was on the Bahs on fair oaks yeah I'm yeah like, what are the these? little you red know, it's like, zeppelin at the forum like wow i couldn't believe it you know it's kind of like a little reddish building so it was a little yeah a little tiny dump you know but yeah. Yeah. Coolest record store ever. Probably. Yeah, it still exists as a in another spot. Yeah, I guess it does. Yeah, yeah. But all the all the hippies are gone. 
<laughs> right, right. So one of the sh one of the shows, well, Magic Mountain is one of the shows I want to talk to you about because most people say that this is when he debuts the black and white guitar, the Stripes. Do you remember anything about? I know? think he had it before Magic Mountain. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You don't have a guitar here, do you? No, I don't. No. <laughs> I got a little story, but I can't tell it without a guitar. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the Magic Mountain show. That's where the first time we think it's at least photographed. Could be. Yeah, that the only be. photograph we know mm -hmm. about of it. So, so that that part of it. The uh, the Starwood. What was like that like as a as a venue? And you said it was all originals, and they had major acts come in and out of there. I saw Detective there. I remember it was mm -hmm. for like the Swan Song release party or something. Which was cool because Ed could get me into certain things like that, you know, because they played there so much. Right. Uh, but yeah, the, the Starwood was great. I liked the Starwood. It's a nice club. That's what George said. He said it was a, had an oversized PA, and he said uh, you had the upper deck and you could get good viewpoints. And mm -hmm. is it was it anywhere in any way was it bigger than the whiskey or, or smaller? Uh, uh, it seems smaller, but maybe not. But you know, I think it was smaller than. So it had a kind of a from the photos, it looks like it had sort of a similar upper deck. Yeah, on the uh, the stage is like in the corner, and then this is just a, a straight up wall, and the sound booth was up there. I had to like look out a window to hear how it sounded in the room. Really right. weird spot. Uh, then the stairs go up here, and there's a little VIP area. Then backstage up here. Yeah. Um, and then the bars underneath the little VIP area over there. I remember I saw Randy Hansen there way right. back. Right. And there was this guy walking around in all white who looked just like Jimi Hendrix. Like I think Chris was there. We were just like, <laughs> we were tripping on this guy. Yeah. He was the embodiment of Hendrix, just in the crowd walking around. Wow. But yeah, Randy Hansen was great, man. Yeah, I know Ed liked him. Yeah, we all saw him at the Roxy when he tried to go all original, I remember. Yeah. Uh, Ed was there. Dave was there. Uh, I think Alex was there. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I remember him talking about him in, in some of the interviews that, that he did over the years. And I guess, Randy, he showed him the Floyd Rose, right? The, for the very first Floyd Rose? I think so. That's the story that, anyway, yeah, he, that Randy tells is that he stepped on it and said, look at this, and it stays in tune. And, and Ed had to have it. <laughs> I bet after all that struggle, he was thinking, man. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I hate locking them myself. <laughs> they don't stay in tune. <laughs> they, have, they do have their little yes, issues, don't they? I'm not a fan. Like everything out there. So the, the Randy Rhodes uh, Glendale show in April of, uh, I think it was April of 77, Greg Leon was on and he talked about it. Were you at that show? No. Okay. I don't think so. I might have been. I don't remember it. Uh, okay. I saw him a lot. And uh, if, they, if they had a big PA, I would have been there, so... Yeah. I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what happened at that one. Oh. Yeah. So Randy Rhodes, what was your impression of him at, in those 70s era? era? Because everybody's, most people say Randy really blossomed with Ozzy. That's true. I wasn't, he wasn't on the radar really at all. Yeah. Quiet Riot, I mean, we, we'd seen him. We just didn't think they were that good. Uh, but we didn't think any of those bands were very good. They were kind of a, we had a high standard for bands to impress us, I guess. Right. In fact, Ed was always looking for inspiration, you know, to, you know, guitar player to inspire him. So I remember I took him to see Robin Ford. Right. At the at Dante's. Right. I thought, okay, because I loved. I, some my friend had just taken me to turn me on to Robin Ford. I thought, oh my God, this guy's great. I said, Ed, you got to see Robin Ford. On the way home, he's all, nah, you know, blues. You know, like, <laughs> fucking Robin Ford can't impress you. I, I don't know what to tell you. You know. <laughs> But he did like Holdsworth eventually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That and that's what it takes. Uh, right, yeah. Holdsworth, an, an alien. <laughs> yeah. My God. Yeah, I mean, I think you know he just kind of like said he stopped listening to music. Yeah, those fusion albums were real big, you know. I, I would make these mixtapes for us to listen to on the way to the whiskey mm -hmm. in Ed's van, you know. And I'd put Billy Cobham on there, and you know that Bill Bruford album with Holdsworth and yeah. stuff like that, you know. Try to keep his attention. <laughs> so did he? Did he? I mean. Some people that said he was in the house, he even had the, like, Fragile by Yes in there. and Probably, yeah. Yeah, and he was listening. I remember when uh, Night at the Opera came out, he asked me, is there anything we can do on there? And I listened to him, I said, I, I don't think so, man. <laughs> you right, know? right. I said, maybe Death on Two Legs, but it was just too much, you know, because they, they were doing Now I'm Here, they did Stone Cold Crazy, did some stuff off of Sheer Heart Attack, but... Yeah, and it's kind of cool that he got to work with Brian May on. Uh, oh yeah, it's very cool. Starfleet. Have you got the reissue of that? I have. Oh, it sounds awesome. Yeah, I heard a little bit that. of it. Yeah, that's For, a must-have. There's some Ed stuff that's I can't believe that's that's way under the radar. That should be much bigger news. 
Right. Unreleased, you know, 83 Ed. Right. It's, it is a, it's a really cool other record. I had it when I was a kid. And, and of course... There's outtakes and other stuff on there. Right, on yeah. the extras. Yeah, the new yeah. one. Yeah, that's amazing stuff, man. The Queen was, yeah, it, it's amazing about... And you got Brian May's glorious tone and Ed's glorious tone. I mean, come yeah. on, you know, it sounds right. so great. Right, yeah, it's, ama- it's an amazing record. And I think about Tony Iommi in that first tour, too, because you, you go into the first tour in 78... You go out with them for a little while, which... Journey in Montrose. Well, it was Chicago was the first show, I think. Okay, so you're in Chicago, mm-hmm. and then and then you make your way over to uh, this Shuffle Inn and some of those, those yeah, smaller gigs. Springfield, and then there was... Detroit. Madison. Yeah, Madison was a... Madison's the famous Sheraton yeah. story where they throw things out the windows and stuff. Yeah, there was a hall in town that wasn't big enough for three bands. So right. they got the gig at the Shuffle Inn there. And... Uh, and the board was this antique piece of junk, I remember at the time. It didn't have any sentence, so we couldn't use Dave's echo. We couldn't go, atomic pump, 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 you know, which was a big deal to Dave. You know? <laughs> I just told him to just to suck it up and go without it. Oh, no, no. So anyway, I thought maybe I can get some adapters that'll work. So me and the, the new stage manager, this guy, Red, who already didn't like me, you know, <laughs> I, he, he, I made him drive me out to... 45 minutes to the only radio shack in the state or whatever, you know, <laughs> to get these adapters. And we get back and sure enough, it didn't work, you know, and he was oh. like, <laughs> you know. Uh, wow. So that was, uh, <laughs> that's what I remember. <laughs> of the so, so like when they would do these, uh, these little club shows off the sides of these, off the tour, what were the, what were those like? I mean, uh, they did that one and they did the other one. Was it a Canes? Canes or Ballroom. You know, with Montrose. Yeah. Yeah. With Ronnie, because I went when I interviewed Greg Renoff, the first one of the, I mean, this is years ago, seven years ago. I went and did it on that stage at Kane's. Oh, right. Yeah, I did it there. And uh, we were talking about the history of that particular show with, with Montrose, because Journey, I guess, I, I was off or something. Or Yeah, it was another of those things. They just kind of had to find a gig or something. It was just, the schedule was changed like at the last minute and they said we can play over here or whatever. Yeah, that first show, they, uh, there was a, a counting of that, I forget which, whether it was No Monk or, but they, they, they had wore these big platform shoes. And they, 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 do you remember anything about that? Well, they always wore those. <laughs> right. But I, th- but I think they kind of like changed their tact after that or something. After or, what? What are you talking about? Because they went out, apparently it was just, it was difficult because it was a tight s- squeeze that first show. Chicago or whatever. Oh, you mean the, yeah, the loading it in the front door or whatever. Yeah, and just getting the stage the side, what what room they had to work with when they got. Well, you should see some of the back. I mean, I got a picture of us backstage with Marshall. The room was like it's a closet, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> Opening bands, I tell you, they got no respect back then, no regard at all. <laughs> yeah, Greg. Greg told me to ask you about the U-Haul and how y'all packed that. <laughs> yeah, that was a uh, Rudy. Got to hand it to Rudy there. We got everything right in. You see that picture? I have a picture of us standing by it before we closed the doors. The bomb was the last thing, you know, right by the door. And it filled that thing up. But then they had to drive it in the snow. And, you know, these guys are from California, you know. Right, right, right. I'm so glad I was 20, you know. I, I wasn't allowed to drive the truck. Uh, Right, I can imagine. That's why on those itineraries, you see, I'm flying with the band while they're they're driving 300 miles through the snow, and I'm I'm kicked back on the. <laughs> right, so the that was nice. <laughs> so yeah, right. So the bomb. This is a great question because everybody <laughs> wants to know where it came from. Um, a lot of people say C and H is this could be there. That's a very good uh, candidate. Also, there was a couple of army surplus stores. Old Town Pasadena was just a mess back then. It wasn't all gentrified yet, and they had these surplus stores. That's where Ed's wearing that shirt, that army shirt. Those were a big day. Everybody had to wear those for a while. Right. Um, I think that's where they even got our parkas that we wore on the tour, possibly. Uh, maybe not. I think they might have ordered those elsewhere. Yeah, I always thought it was cool how they, like... But he yeah. might have got the bomb there. That was mostly clothes at those. I, I think it could have been G&H or C&H. Is it G&H? C&H. C&H. C&H, C&H, C&H yeah. Where it says, yeah. Yeah, that, that's because they had crazy stuff in there, you know. Right. Oscillator, Frankenstein, you, you name it. I mean, stuff you just never saw. What is this, you know? <laughs> right, right. Well, you'd see him, like, use the, you know, how you got the, the connections for the strap, where you use eye bolts. He would use, like, industrial, oh, yeah, yeah. you know, anything. <laughs> like, he had, like, we'd come up with these contraptions. Well, well you see him cutting off his SG, right? And, right, right, to make it work. Or they said in the studio, right? I want to mic this speaker. He just ripped the, the cloth, you know, without a second thought about it, you know. Whatever it takes. <laughs> yeah, you know, when I think of that first album, and I think of You Really Got Me, and I, I actually saw a video recently of uh, Dave Davies uh, cutting the speaker and showing how it, actually doing it now, like today, 
and doing it. And then he played it, you know, and it did sound like modern. Oh, really? Yeah, gain, right? And then I think of that first recording and how powerful that was. You, you saw that, obviously, in the clubs beforehand. And one of the things that people don't realize is that that wasn't forced on them. That was a song they already did. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and then... The and, song that was forced on them was Young and Wild. Right, right, yeah. which I knew about. Uh, which was a weak tune. Kim, Kim, Kim Fowley, Fowley was yeah. really trying to elbow his way into Van Halen, you know? Right, because he was the guy who got uh, Marshall Burrell connected. Is that how it yeah, worked? Like, well, yeah, something like that. Something like that. He had the Runaways, you know, and so we ended up roadieing a gig for the Runaways, I remember, the crew at the... Was that Santa Monica Civic with the Ramones? I think me and Rudy and Greg went and helped out that gig. Yeah, we helped uh, Marshall's dad move, which was funny. Phil Burl, who's a brother of Milton Burl, right? So he's just he's got all these magic tricks. We're at lunch and he's doing he's pulling you know cards out of the banana peel and stuff. Uh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's that's amazing. The... But yeah, Kim. I mean, uh, Kim Fowley had that Young and Wild thing. They did it a couple times for him. You know, they. Yeah, I hear it on the demos. So he, they did it at the Civic too, I think. Did they? Yeah, there's a live version of it. I know. Wow. Yeah, I heard about how that was to come. It was sort of like a like a. Glad it didn't make any records or anything. Right. Well, it, well, it didn't. Yeah, it didn't no, really it fit. Was, it wasn't it, a Van Halen. It wasn't really. It wasn't. They gave it a shot, you know. <laughs> That's wild. So the, the, one of the one of the things I want to ask you about the first of oh, that tour, you know, you're you're out in '78 with them. Um, later, you leave the tour. But you do attend this giant show at Anaheim Stadium. Yeah. And um, and I read back through the archives of Van Halen News Desk of what you kind of said. Now, I was there the other day shooting it as a vlog, and the stage was facing into the stadium from what I saw. It's out there in the left center field, I guess. Right, like kind that. of like, and, and so the famous parachute stunt yeah you witnessed this. oh yeah yeah <laughs> can you recount that <laughs> i gotta be honest i believed it at the time okay <laughs> i totally fell for it i thought they actually did that you know and i go backstage and i tell rudy i can't believe they did that and rudy goes yeah me neither <laughs> you know and then i went oh yeah yeah well of course they did you know what am i thinking you know <laughs> For a minute, though, I thought they did, but that the yeah, idea that was a great stunt. That's you know stealing the show in a big way. <laughs> so explain that, like like how the crowd responded to this. Oh, they went crazy. You hear Rudy up from the skies. That's funny. And then you see the guy, and then the shoot opening, and VH was on one of the shoots there, and they you know they floated on down, and the crowd, they, the crowd was going crazy the whole time, you know. And they floated down, but behind kind of behind the, the stage. stage. And then they came running out in their jump seats. Yeah, brilliant, you know. Right, right, right. <laughs> Because they said there that Van Halen was in there in a van. I guess, yeah. And, the, the, and then they, they the got, other guys jumped in the jumped van in, and jumped swapped out. out and then uh, there's that one little clip of video over all. You got to get one of the jumpers. You should probably try to right. track down one of those guys. <laughs> Call be, me. That would be, be, be trivia. <laughs> Call me. <laughs> I'd love to talk to him. But yeah, that's an amazing show. And one of the other things that I found out about that show was that as they were coming up to their platinum um, sales on that, which is another month out, or a few weeks out, October. Um, they gave them these necklaces uh, as uh, like a thing that day, apparently. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you knew about that or no, I didn't noticed know. that. But yeah, that, I never got one. <laughs> yeah, that they, uh, well, they would have had to pay for it. Because <laughs> they paid for their own. Yeah. <laughs> as they always say, you know, that's one of the things they always bring up about that. The things. budget. Right, well, they always, you know, how, how they would always have the bands paying for everything. <laughs> Um, Eddie, you know, since you knew Eddie from, th what, 13? Something like that, yeah. So is that when you really first got to know him and mm -hmm. hang out with him? Mm hmm And then you saw you saw him when was the last time you saw him? Uh, 2019, was it? Okay. Yeah, right before the pandemic. So what did you guys get together then? At his house. Okay. And that was the first time I ever been to 5150. Really? Mm-hmm. Wow. What, what was the occasion? I, we just wanted to see him, you know, uh. I haven't seen him in 20 years or whatever, you know. Right, right. Actually, my brother, Rob, he Googled 5150 and sent Ed a telegram and said, hey, man, because he didn't have his number at the time or anything. Right, right. And so it worked out, and we all went out, me, Rob, and Rick all went out and saw Ed, and it was great to see him. He was, this is right before he, things went south. He had a, a pain in his back, and, you know, he thought he could just zap it, and we were going to go see him again, but it, it was nice to hang out anyway. Uh, I remember in the studio, 
he points to this little combo app. He says, Jimmy Page gave me that. Sounds like shit. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay. Probably doesn't, but... Right, right. And he played, he, the main thing, he played Wolfie's album for us, you know. He was oh, real hey, proud of that. Did yeah. he? Cranking over the speakers in 5150. I got a little video that I'll have to send you. Wow, wow. So he was uh, showing you Wolfie stuff because he talked about it, you know. Oh, yeah. I, I was with it. Uh, I couldn't, I was blown away, man. I'm still blown away. I'm a huge fan of Wolfie. Right, that out, those two albums are great. Yeah, the second one especially is unbelievably good. I mean, right, it's amazing. Right, it's all him too. I there. know. <laughs> wow, you know, it's it's crazy to watch him play too. To watch him. Yeah, when I watch him do interviews, I'm telling you, he's got a lot of Pasadena in him, man. Whether he knows it or not, he just I, I I'm sure I would get along really well. When you say that, what do you mean? I don't know. It's just a thing. I don't know. I don't okay. know how to say it. It's just a thing. Yeah. So you, that was really cool that you got to see him. You know, one more time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the, the early days, you know, how, how did, you know, his personality when he was a kid versus how he was when he was in 2019, how different was he? Not much different, really. Really? But of course, I mean, he's not, I mean, I just feel bad for, you know, he can't walk down the street without people bothering him. He's just, he's not like Dave who loves that shit. He, I'm sure he hates that shit. I would, anybody would, you know. Right, right. You can't go anywhere, you know, but... uh did you, I mean, because I always ask that question about about that, whether he felt like he was, I don't want to say confined to 5150, but, but. Well, maybe he was, you know, but. Uh, yeah, and he was close to his dad from what he always said. Oh, yeah. He just loved his dad. You know, there's a, one time at the whiskey, and then there was people in the club too, so it was after we, we would go out there and sound check and go home and eat dinner or whatever, and then come back. And we had come back to the club and Ed had forgotten something, I don't remember what it was, something very important. And he had to call his dad and say, bring it to Hollywood. And of course, his dad didn't want to do that. And so he's, he's on the uh, payphone at the whiskey, just shouting in Dutch at his dad, you know. Yeah. <laughs> They're having this big, he doesn't want, and finally he talked him into bringing this thing. I don't even remember what it could have possibly been, unless it was his guitar or something, I don't know. But uh, Wow. But that was funny. I remember he forced his dad to drive out to freaking Hollywood. Wow. And he did. Wow. <laughs> Eventually. Funny. Yeah, and his mom, you know, they, he, she was the disciplinarian. Everybody said she was the one that cracked the whip. Could be, yeah. Yeah. His dad was a musician, too, you know. <laughs> yeah, he was, like, he was like their buddy, uh -huh. in a way, it seemed like. Yeah. And there was a picture, I think, of Rudy with his dad. It's hard to tell, but it looks like his dad has the shark in his hands. Oh, yeah? Could I don't know be, if you've yeah. ever seen this, but it's a really <laughs> odd photo that I found. And, and everybody's like, that's Jan, but he had glasses on in this. Yeah. Of course, he, he had glasses, but, but he had a hat on. That was what it was. Mm -hmm. It was different, so we didn't really notice. But, but yeah, so Alex, Alex and Ed, personality-wise, what was, how were they different? Well, just like you see them now. I mean, there's, there's not a lot of, Alex was much more, you know. Was he in charge of the business, like everybody said? Well, Dave would do a lot of the booking, but Alex would be on top of everything, just like now, you know. Yeah, yeah right. Wow, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool stuff, man. Yeah, Ed's the younger brother, so he was a, would defer to Al, you know. Yeah, I always heard that Ed didn't pick, like, the covers. They kind of like... I don't know about that. I think they all agreed on those. Did you know? they? Yeah, I have a, a table them rehearsing, and they're going over a Thin Lizzy tune. Right. And Dave's saying, it's on the charts right now, you know. Uh, he's trying to get them to play some top 40, you know, and he's pushing this song, it's it's top 40 to you know. Right, right, right. Because they was trying to also make them appeal to uh, women, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So they started playing songs that people know, you know, instead of these obscure things. That, right, 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 yeah, right. Which I dug all of it, you know, I mean. Right. You said you were at the, in Dave's basement with them, rehearsing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, was, what was the basement like, and what was it, what was that like? Well, it was just a bass tank, you know, dark. <laughs> But it sounded good down there. Mike played through this little amp that sounded great, I thought. Uh, yeah. It had the Marshall, but yeah, they sounded really good in the basement. Sometimes they would set up this way, sometimes they'd go the long way. Is it a big space? Hmm? Is it a pretty big space? It's kind of long and narrow, but then there's other rooms down there. Okay. Uh, wow. Where we recorded the demo table was in one of the other rooms where there's like a pool table and stuff. Uh, wow. There's a stairway right from the kitchen down into the basement, and then there's one from outside, too which is where we would load all the cabinets and stuff, you know. Uh -huh. 
So you got to carry the marshal up the stairs, you know. <laughs> right, right. 412. Yeah. Right. So Mike, you know, Mike seems like the guy that just everybody loves. and uh, He's I, a serial killer. <laughs> yeah, he's got bodies in his, in his backyard. Mike did it. I got to puncture this Mike as a nice guy bullshit. <laughs> I'm sure he's sick of it, too. <laughs> Probably wants to kill somebody. <laughs> well, his brothers and all of him, they all played. That's a pretty cool story. Well, Mike is this, yeah, he is the nicest guy in the world, really. Really, yeah. He I'm came not. into my store where I worked, you know, I had to uh -huh. get some barbecue parts and talked about his hot sauce. The next thing I know, I'm getting a case of hot sauce. You know, he followed through. He, he didn't just say, I'll send you some. I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, there it is, you know. Good stuff, too. Yeah, yeah Really yeah. good. Matt Anthony's. Yeah. Highly recommend it. He's a great guy, man. That's crazy. All those years that you spent with those guys. I mean, that's like, you know, geez, from the 60, 68 all the way to 2019. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's wild. Long time. You know, thinking back through the whole period with Ed and, and his brother, you know, the, what's that like for you to kind of look back on and then reflect on what he did? I mean, I, I know you, you felt like he was going to be somebody when he was young. Yeah. And then to see that all come to fruition. Yeah, I was not surprised at all, you know. All right, <laughs> right. Um, can't even imagine it not happening, really, you know. Right. I mean, they were so good, even in 74, you know. They were just lightning good already, you know. Right, right. And Ed was just a sweetheart. He was always so nice to me, you know. Always nice to me. First thing, you know, when we got back together, we, he texted me at Christmas, um, and he says, listen to Jeff Beck's Wired in the blue van, man. Good times, you know. And that's funny because that's the main thing that I remember, too, is the good times. Those drives in the van with Ed, you know. So we would just yak and stuff, go to Pioneer Chicken and drive. You know, I remember we were driving down Sunset and uh, these chicks are going, hey, hey. You know, they're trying to pull Ed over at the red light. They, she throws this, you know, porn mag in and she's all, I'm on page 49, you know. <laughs> And it's like, what, what? I'm like, hey, you got to drive. Let me check that out. You know, we're driving down the street. <laughs> that was, you know, later in the whiskey days and stuff. Pioneer Chicken would give him gas. And we'd drive home. We'd be opening the door all the way home because he's just cutting the cheese, you know. <laughs> Very polite of him to do that. <laughs> I hear, I've heard about the blue van. Yeah, the blue van with the light blue back door. Uh-huh. This, this is the one. Well, there was a time when he had that small car that they said he used to like put his 412 in it somehow i don't know well, his it. car was bigger than al's uh, he had the big old uh, volvo and al had the little opal cadet okay but al would get his whole double base set in that little car somehow i guess he put the you know took the bottom heads off and funneled them together or whatever so you'd see al driving by the street you know and his hair was just out to here and he has his little car and all the drums in the back look like a cartoon you know <laughs> Much more than Ed. <laughs> well, I'd always heard like Ed would like literally tie down the back of the, the back. Yeah, yeah, like wire. I think it was on his door, really. Yeah, something yeah. Something holding it together. Holding it together. We'd have to get oil on the way to the whiskey just to make it, you know. <laughs> That's wild. Yeah, it was really a piece of junk, but he <laughs> somehow yeah. he kept it going, man. <laughs> there was a, there was the, the, the van, it was that later, I guess. They got a van, that van later on after they had the cars, and then they got the vans. Then they got the blue van, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of like the gigging vehicle. Mm -hmm. And you would uh, ride along with him on all those gigs? On yeah, because he would pick me up, and then we would go. Everybody else would meet us there at the whiskey. Right, right. Tracy G., who I interviewed out in, uh, not long ago. I don't know if you remember him. Yeah, I played in a band with you. Okay, so yeah. He, he, he had a really good recollection of all those uh, Golden West, while well, the Golden West was one. Yeah, he's got a better memory than me, especially about the opening bands and stuff, you know. Right, right. <laughs> but right. we would be backstage. We wouldn't really be paying attention to him, but, but right. he'd be out there suffering, you know, at the whiskey, watching The Quick or whoever. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> But yeah, you did have a lot of great stories about oh, yeah, yeah. the earlier days and, and, and all <laughs> Tracy that. Tracy gets a great tone, too. He, he was really good with his marshals and stuff. Yeah. He had the Echoplex and everything. Yeah, the, the whole way that Ed changed equipment, when you think about that, I mean, you know, what do you think about how, you know, did you see that coming as he was boiling strings on the... I didn't think it would be a EVH industry, really, <laughs> you know, but... Uh, <laughs> It's hard to imagine he's the only one, the first one to think of putting a humbucker in a strap, you know? Right, right. I mean, 
when we think about you look at I look at the whole wall at Guitar Center and I'm going and, and, none of those would be I know it's amazing <laughs> I know it's uh, it's crazy because I always say that about Nam too is you can walk through Nam and you'll see little things you know where Ed you know these little Ed inspired like the I was yesterday I was like look at those Tom DeLong strats and it's just an invader in the back of a strat <laughs> I'm thinking you know <laughs> That's, that's My old it. guitar player had a good story. He was at NAMM in the 90s. I forget what year. And he said the door opens and Ed walks in. He says, he says it was like Jesus. <laughs> like everybody parted and you know, ran over them to him. And right. He was a huge star at the time. I wasn't at that one, I don't think. Right. That, you, you know, uh, Jazz Obrecht, who was one of the early the guy who first interviewed Ed in, in, in um, 78, uh, kind of by accident, said that he felt like that Ed was a very sensitive person and that he got into the wrong industry almost because he was so sensitive. Did you, do you feel like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. A lot of artists are that way, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't think the bad reviews got to him or anything like that, but just, he just wanted to play his guitar, you know, that's it. <laughs> so, well, the there, there, it. there was the, you know, there was a, con- there, he said this in interviews with different journalists that he lived to please his father. And that at one point in Europe, an old monk's book says that he wanted to come home. He was in Paris or somewhere, and he just had had it already. And Noel said to him, look, you know, you want to take care of your mom and dad. Oh, You're, yeah, you wanted to quit. I saw that story. That's in, the, that's in Noel's book, I think, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Does that seem plausible to you? Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So that's the, that's the ad you knew. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Even later, it seemed like. Even like, you know. How about the story when he's in Amsterdam, right? Which one? Uh, and he's crying at the bar. I don't know. And they don't know why he's crying. Ed, what's, what's the matter? He smelled his father's tobacco. Oh, yeah, I remember that story. Yeah. I just said that, yeah. Yeah, I forgot when I saw that or where I saw that. But, yeah, I remember that, yeah. Yeah, he loved his dad. Yeah. For sure. And his, and, uh, and his brother, the, the, the fights are... <laughs> Did you ever see them actually go to blows? You know, at the Cabaret Club, I remember... Uh, I remember there was a scene, Alex got into a fight with his girlfriend, Mindy, or something, and Ed had to get in Al's face and, and, and tell him, you know, that he didn't know what the hell he's talking about or something. And he started yelling it right in Al's face, you know, and then he told us all, like, you know, split, you know. I thought he was going to start yelling in Dutch at Al, but he didn't. He was talking English the whole time. Right, right. You're fucking up, Al. Listen to me. You're fucking up, man. You know, like a... <laughs> wow. So, you know, you even get on... It wasn't always Al, you know. <laughs> it was... Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there there are a lot of stories like the one where there's a story where Al would would get him down and he would try to not hurt his hands. If is that is that something that you? I can't imagine that. No. Like they would like hold him so he wouldn't punch him. You know, like, like break his fingers. <laughs> but Al was, you know, he's bigger. <laughs> yeah, he could if he wanted to. Yeah. Right, right, right. That's that's amazing. That good the, threat. So Roth himself, you know, you said you really liked liked him. Yeah. And and then later on, you know, you get on that first tour. How did he handle? It? How did he handle it? Fine. <laughs> it, was, it was what he was meant to oh, do. Oh God, yes, yeah. Because people say that he, he couldn't wait to get out on stage, man. Yeah, yeah. There's a story of Steve Stevens just told where he went to eat, and Steve thought he would want a private booth, and he said, "No, I want to sit out on in the front where everybody can see me." <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Dave to me. <laughs> That's exactly so what happened. Ed would not say that. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. <laughs> and he said he walked all the way back, I don't know how many blocks, to his hotel or whatever. This this is when he was courting Steve Stevens to be in the Eat Him and Smile band mm-hmm. at one point. And, uh, he, it would have been good. <laughs> yeah, right. It would have yeah. been good. Yeah. So it was a crazy story. But yeah, I've always heard, you know, even Dave, uh, Dave's classmates said that Dave was saying he was going to be a rock star before he was even a teenager. Yeah, there's only one Dave. <laughs> <laughs> and it's crazy that he still lives right over here. Yes? Yeah. I thought he was living in Japan or whatever. Uh, I think he he goes around a lot, but he was at one time. But I think he's Those still... videos look like those might be his house. I don't know about the arched windows, but uh, mm-hmm. that could be his house, actually. Yeah, I think I he... know, Those weird videos he's doing lately. <laughs> right, lately? Yeah, I don't know what's going on with that. I don't know what's going on with it. Trash talking Wolfie. And I, I, I don't get it. I don't either. I was, I, we were that's been going around for a few days with the, the yeah, yeah. people everybody's been like going what is going on with that and why is he doing that you know I, I know the whole whole thing is just <laughs> I, I was thinking I might want to you know look up Dave and talk to him but now I'm thinking well maybe not 
<laughs> a buddy of mine was over by his house the other day, and the gate was open. I said, don't go in there. Yeah, when you went there, the gate was open. You should have went in there, man. <laughs> oh, no. Because well, that gate's never open. <laughs> you were there on a good day, man. No, it was another time. It was recently. It was uh -huh. like, like a, my buddy was here also, and he went over there, and the gate was open. And I said, don't go in there. Don't bother me. Go knock on his door. Come out here, you <laughs> bastard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was like, you know, for you, the Beatles, right? The the whole... S well, then Zeppelin, you know. Me and Alex, I mean, both idolized Bonham. Mm -hmm. Bonham was the shit, you know. It was the gold standard, you know. I remember at the uh, Smokehouse gig in Redondo Beach, Al had finally got... He had ordered a 26-inch bass drum. He finally got it. Mm -hmm. He was all excited about it. Right. So he was putting a heads on it, and he was trying to tune it up. And it was just going, boy, it sounds like shit. You know, he couldn't get it to sound good. And so he abandoned it, and he just went with his normal kit that night, because he said, how does Bonham fucking do it, you know? Right. And then when they went to see Zeppelin at the Forum, I remember Al reporting back. He was, wooden beater, no muffling. How's he fucking doing it, man? <laughs> right, right, right. That's, yeah, because like, that's, that's what he had the clear, he had the clear, you know. The acrylic. Yeah, that you could hardly see that was. Right, right. Yeah, the drums. But, you know, that's why I, I, there's no doubt when they got to, what's his name, uh, uh, Andy Johns to help produce the record. Right. He would immediately say, I want that John Bonham sound, you know. Right, right. And he, and he got it. I forgot to ask it if there was any uh, tricks that he got from Andy. Right. Because right. the drums sounded good on the album he produced. They, they, did. they did. They did. And the one after that weren't too bad either. Mm -hmm. Bruce Fairburn. It was a great album. It's funny, on that Pretty Woman single, I thought the drums sounded really good. Yeah. And, and, I thought then, and right after that's when he went to the Simmons. As if he still wasn't satisfied with his kick drum being loud enough in the mix or something. That's my theory, anyway. On the on the Simmons drum. So he went to the Simmons, so you can actually hear the, the bass drums, you know. The click, the upper Cause, click. Because he can never get the bottom sound. We can hear every detail, you know. Uh, right, right. Well, that's a different. But then they got you know Don Landy that made that '84 album just sound great somehow with the Simmons, regardless. <laughs> right. I think it was kind of a, probably a little, watching it live was a little harder to translate it, but. But uh, definitely, Dan, Don was a magician. Yeah. <laughs> that guy, did you ever meet him? No. No? No. I didn't go to any of the recording sessions. Yeah. So uh, I was telling Greg, you know, I was just in the dark until they suddenly, I got the report from Rudy about what was going to be on the album, you know, because we didn't know what songs they were going to pick. And we, right. all had, we all had our preferences, you know. Right, right. And Rudy was like, both punk songs made the album. You know, like really disappointed that Atomic Punk and Ain't Talking About Love made the album, you know. <laughs> yeah, wow, those are great songs, too. Uh, yeah, the album wouldn't be the same now without them, you know. I love but, those, too. I mean, to me, that Atomic Punk is the, is David Lee Ross theme song, almost. It's like, uh -huh. and Eddie's, in a way. It, it kind of embodies both of them and their whole vibe. It's crazy. Well, I appreciate you coming out, man. And, sure. And, Pasadena is a beautiful place. I, hey, I love January in I just Pasadena, want, right? I love it. You gonna go mean, back home and freeze to death or <laughs> something? So when Ed went out of that first tour, did like, did did it freak him out? The, all the crazy weather. Oh man, when we first got to Chicago, you know, we get on the plane in L.A. and you know, right. we're dressed like this, you know, and then it's snowing horizontally, you know. One thing that's, uh, that reminded me of that is uh, we were staying on like the 80th floor and they had glass all the way to the floor, the windows, you know? Yeah. And so we were standing right up next to the window. I'm like, Dave, come do this, man. And Dave wouldn't go near the windows. He was afraid of heights. Yeah, yeah. So when I saw that Skyscraper album and he's hanging off a cliff, I'm going, wow, you know, this wow. guy really conquered his fears big time, you know. I was, he did, he did I was stuff impressed. like that. And yeah, the jungle studs just going in the middle of nowhere, the Nile. Or <laughs> the stuff he did was just, and, and, and it's, it's just so crazy, but yeah. he, he did so many things in his life. But. <laughs> Man, I really appreciate you doing this. Sure. Thank you for being a, a guest on the you Family bet. Stories, time, man. man. And next time I'm out, I'd love to see you again and hang out. We'll do part two. That'd be great. All right, y'all. Right, there it is. Van Halen Stories, episode number 37. Thanks for joining us.